your attention to the gospel according to Luke chapter 23. The gospel according to Luke chapter 23. My text, pardon me, make that Luke 24. The 24th chapter of Luke. And my text will be in verse 27. My message is titled, Christ in all the scriptures. I'm going to begin reading from verse number 13. Jesus Christ had been crucified and killed. This was not quite the end that his disciples had imagined. They were quite perplexed that he had died. Then they learned that he's been raised from the dead. And they did not understand that matter. And they're very perplexed. What's going on? This is not the way we imagined and thought it was going to be. And so, they're discussing this among themselves and wondering what's next. And indeed, what has happened and what is next. In verse 13, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, we read that now behold, two of them, of the Lord's disciples, not of His apostles, but they were disciples, were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're walking from Jerusalem, and they're walking to evidently the village in which they lived, Emmaus, or perhaps the village in which they were staying at that time. Seven miles away. So you can imagine how long it takes to walk seven miles. That's what they're going to be doing. It's going to take them a while to walk that distance. And they talked together of all of these things which had happened. The death of Christ and, and what had led to his death. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. So now, two men walking together, and a third man joins them, and they do not know that it is Jesus. They're talking about Jesus, but do not know that it is him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he, Jesus, said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers, that would have been the Sanhedrin, the council of 70 elders that governed the affairs in Israel, chief priests, rulers, scribes and Pharisees among them, they delivered Jesus to be condemned to death and crucified Him. But we were hoping that it was He who was going to redeem Israel, deliver us from our bondage to the Romans. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find His body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said Jesus was alive. And certain of those who were with us 
went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, Jesus, they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And here's my text. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus had earlier said to some people, you search the scriptures, you should know about me because the scriptures speak of me. I am the theme of the scriptures. But men read the scriptures and do not understand that he's the theme of them and indeed they do not understand the things that are written in the scriptures concerning Jesus. If you'll look later in this chapter down around verse 44, Jesus met with his apostles and in that passage we read that in verse 44 he said to them these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures now from these three texts, John 5, 39, and here in Luke's Gospel, verse 27, and in verse 45, I want you to learn that the theme of all the Scriptures is Jesus Christ. He's the theme. Right. All the way through. All the way through. You see this book? This is our hymn book. And He, Jesus Christ, is the hymn, H-I-M, of this book. This is a book of history. And this history is his story. Mm -hmm. That's the history of this book. It's his story. The English Navy years ago put a scarlet thread in every strand of rope that belonged to the English Navy and you better not have a piece of that rope in your private possession. Because it was a scarlet thread that ran through the entire, every piece of rope. Well, Jesus Christ is a scarlet thread running through the scriptures all the way through, all the way through. Yes. Notice that Jesus began at Moses. He went to the book of Genesis. Yes. And from Genesis, in the Psalms and in the Prophets, he expounded unto them the things concerning himself. He's the thing. He says, this book, it's all about me. Yes. This is why that every faithful gospel preacher takes his text from any place in God's word and goes to Christ. Yes. We look at this text, we look at that one, and we look at this one, and we're looking for Christ. Yes. It is said that every road in England leads to London. You may be in some deserted place in England and you find a cow path, follow it. The cow path becomes a cart path and the cart path becomes a one lane dirt road, becomes a one lane gravel road, becomes a one lane paved road, two lane paved road, next thing you know you're on an expressway and they're all leading to London. Every road in England leads to London. Well, every text in this book leads to Christ. Yes, absolutely. Jesus preached many messages. We have somewhat lengthy summaries of some of them. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, three chapters. It's probably just a summary but in some depth, we here have a message by Jesus. There's the Olivet Discourse, a message he preached on the Mount of Olives, the Upper Room Discourse, another message he preached in the Upper Room. And some of these go for quite a few verses in two or three chapters. 
this message. I, I hope I'm not being disrespectful when I say that if I could hear but one message Jesus preached, I, I wish I could have heard that one. He began in Moses and in all the prophets all the way through talked about the things concerning himself. Now, it was a rather long message. How long does it take you to walk seven miles? Well, Jesus for seven miles, he spoke of this. He said, you know that passage speaks of that? That's me. And there in that passage, that's me. And here in this passage, that's me. And he spoke of all the things concerning himself. Now, I do not have a time tonight, and, and I am, it, it is, it, it would be a task beyond my ability and beyond my comprehension to set forth to you everything in, in, in the Old Testament concerning Jesus Christ. But we're going to look in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, just those three chapters. <laughs> and, I want, and I want you to see tonight that the theme of all the scriptures, and I think I can show it to you from just those three chapters, that the one theme of all the scriptures is Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. and He's on every page. Mm -hmm. now, it may it may be sometimes like a, a cow path, and you've got to go some distance before you find the the way to Him, but He's there. I want you to go to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and first of all, I want you to see that Jesus Christ is present in the Old Testament actually. In fact, I've got four points. Christ is present in the Old Testament actually, prophetically, evangelistically, and typically. Those are my four points. Christ is present in the Old Testament actually. In the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now you may say, well that's Jehovah. That is correct. If you say that's Jehovah, you are correct. In the beginning, Jehovah created the heavens and the earth. But when you come to the New Testament, you're going to find passages that say words like this. All things were created by Jesus Christ, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Everything. Everything that was made was made by Jesus Christ. When you come to Genesis 1-1, what you are being taught is that in the beginning, Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth. Yes. Everything that was created, mm -hmm. He's the one who did it. It was not God the Father who did it. It was Jesus Christ, or if you will, God the Father doing it through Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is the agent. Jesus Christ is the one who said, Let there be light, and there was light. Let the dry land appear, and the dry land appeared. That was Jesus Christ. Yes. He is in the Old Testament all the way through, actually. Now a little later in chapter 3 you'll read that Adam and Eve sinned, and having been beguiled, Eve was by the serpent. And so God came down and pronounced judgment. He said to the serpent, He said, Upon your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And he looked at the woman who had sinned, and he said, You're going to bear children and be in childbirth with much pain and sorrow, and your husband will rule over you. And then he said to the man, And you, sir... You're going you're gonna to eat by the sweat of your brow. You're going to work till the day you die and then return to dust. That was judgment mm -hmm. against the serpent, against the woman, and against the man. It was God who pronounced that yes. judgment. But God did it in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. He himself has declared, the Father judges no one. God the Father judges no one, but commits all judgment to the Son that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. One of these days, we're going to give an account to God. Every one of us, we're going to stand before God to be judged. The judge is going to be Jesus Christ. Yes. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament. He actually is there. Even from Genesis chapter 1, He is there actually. Second, He is there prophetically. Locate Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Here is the very first prophecy that is found in all of God's Word. The very first prophecy in God's Word. Genesis 3, 15. The Lord is speaking to the serpent in the presence of the man and the woman, Adam and Eve. And God said, verse 15, I will put enmity, hatred, animosity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and I will put enmity between your seed, the seed of the serpent, and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his head. That's the very first prophecy in the Bible, and God gave it. God gave it. And if you will, Jesus Christ gave it. God gave it in the person of Jesus Christ. He is, by the way, our prophet. Is he not? Yes. Our prophet was the one who gave this prophecy. Now, this is the first prophecy in God's Word. It's going to be enmity between the seed of the serpent, that's every one of whom Jesus says, you are of your father the devil and the deeds of your father you want to do. It's going to be hatred between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. Well, that's been true, has it not been? That is true. The children of Satan hate Jesus Christ. Yes. And then the prophecy said also that, that Satan, the serpent, will bruise the heel of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, shall crush his head. That's the first prophecy in Scripture. Well, it was fulfilled just as it was said. The prophet there was the prophecy was given that that Jesus Christ would be the seed of the woman. And that really is the point that I want to stress in, in this point because I'm going to come later to the second part of later, but I want you to see that Messiah the Christ would be the seed of the woman. Her seed. Later on, this is amplified. The virgin shall conceive. Well, preacher, that's a physical impossibility. Your God doesn't think so. God said, nope, it'll happen. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. With us is God, or God with us. The prophet Jeremiah says, or God speaks to Jeremiah and says, I'm going to do something that has never been done. A woman shall compass a man. That's Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 22. A woman shall compass a man. Well, what does that mean? Well, a man is going to be inside a woman. In her womb. But notice the word that is used for man in that text. It's not the word for a male. It's not the word or you know for an ordinary man. It is the word Gibur, a mighty man. That's the name of Jesus Christ. His name shall be called Mighty God, El Gibur. Well, here the manly part, the hero of a man in the womb of a woman is going to be a hero of a man. God said, I'm going to do something never been done. He's talking about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, we read of a man named Joseph, and he lives in Galilee. He is espoused to a woman named Mary. And he thought she was a virgin, but she is pregnant. And he knows he's not the father. And so he can have her stoned or he can secretly divorce her. And he's wondering what can he do. He's very perplexed about this. Because his estranged, or pardon me, his espoused wife, I did not mean to say estranged. His espoused wife, she's virgin, he thinks, but she's with child. And what shall I do? I want to do the honorable thing, but what shall I do? And an angel from God came down and said, Fret not concerning this. That which is in her is conceived of the Holy Spirit. 
She is virgin. She has never known a man. But that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bear a, a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, and he is Emmanuel. The virgin has conceived and will bear a son. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Well, the prophecy that Messiah would be born of a woman was began was begun there in Genesis chapter 3 in the very first prophecy. Her seed. That seed is Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ is in the Old Testament prophetically. And He is in the Old Testament evangelistically. Same text in Genesis 3.15. Not only is that the first prophecy in God's Word, it also is the first gospel message in God's Word. We have a fancy word for it. We call it Evangelium. Simply means first gospel message. The first time the gospel was preached was right here in Genesis 3.15. And here is the gospel. The gospel is found in these words. He, speaking of Christ, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the gospel. You say, well, now, preacher, I, I don't see much of the gospel in there. You, you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. All prophecy from God is progressive. You could not have taken it the first time. You, you could not have taken the full gospel the first time God gave it. So he gave it bit by bit. And that's why that our gospel is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's why that it took so it took so many prophets, so many pages, and so many prophecies to set forth the, the gospel. Mm -hmm. There's the first seed of it. Then this is added to it. He'll be seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, seed of Isaac, seed of Jacob, and seed of Judah. Son of David, born of a virgin. Bit by bit, the gospel has come down to us. Now you may say, but preacher, look at that. It says that, that Christ shall bruise Satan's head and Satan shall bruise his heel. When did that happen? And what does that have to do with the gospel? Well, take a look at Calvary. Take a look at that cross. You'll see a man on that cross. His brow is pierced by the crown of thorns. There are holes in his brow all the way around his head. He's got a spike through this hand and a spike through that hand and a spike through that foot and a spike through that foot. His back and his torso have been plowed like a field when he was whipped. And a soldier comes up and takes a spear and drives it into his side. When you look at all those holes in the body of Jesus Christ, in his brow, in his hands, in his feet, and in his side, in his back, and in his torso, what you're looking at are the fangs of Satan have sunk in to his heel. His heel is his lowest part. That's his humanity. Satan could touch the humanity or the heel of Christ, but he could not touch his deity. But he touched the heel. There are fang marks across his brow, fang marks in his hands and in his feet and in his side. Satan has bitten Christ and bruised him, but in so doing, Satan lunged, got the heel of Christ, latched on to the heel of Christ, and Christ has crushed his head into the ground. He was born for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil mm -hmm. and free those who had been in bondage to him. That's what Christ did. When Christ said, it is finished, he was saying, Satan, you have bitten me for the last time and I have now destroyed you. Yeah. Crossed his head. That's the gospel. And yes. it began back there in the book of Genesis. So Christ is in the Old Testament and notice, we, 
we're just barely looking at Genesis chapter 1 through 2 and 3. In fact, we've not looked at much of 2. It's been chapters 1 and 3. Already we've seen Christ as in the Old Testament. Actually, prophetically, and evangelistically with regard to the gospel. I want you to see now that he's in the Old Testament typically. Sometimes these things take considerable Time to study to understand. Types and shadows and figures. Mm -hmm. Oh, this book is full of them. Yes. This book is full yes. of them. Types and shadows. When you look at that tabernacle, that tabernacle is a type of Christ. It's a tent. The New Testament says He tabernacled among us. He lived among us in a tent, His human body. You look at that altar, at the tabernacle. That's Christ. There's a labor of running water. That's Christ, the water of life. You walk into the tabernacle and there is a table of showbread. You see that bread? That's Christ. You see that menorah or the lampstand giving light into the, into the dark room? That's Christ. You see that incense altar that's got that sweet incense coming up from it? That's Christ interceding and pleading for His people. You go into the Holy of Holies, if you could, the high priest could only once a year, but he went into the Holy of Holies, he saw the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Christ is explicitly said to be the Mercy Seat. Yes. You go into the whole you go into that Holy of Holies, and God Himself was between the wings of the cherubs over the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. God was there in His bright Shekinah glory. That's Christ. He's right there. When you look at the tabernacle, it's not just a tent with a priest. By the way, the priest is Christ. Yes. You see that lamb on the altar? The altar is Christ. Everything there is a type and a picture pointing us to Christ. Yes. So that when so that when Israel came to the tabernacle to worship, whether they knew it or not, and some did, at least partly, they were witnessing the gospel being unfolded right there before them. They were seeing Christ all the way through the scriptures. All right, we're going to look briefly at some types and shadows of Christ here in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, locate that passage, if you will, or that text. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. I'm going to begin reading verse 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. When this earth was created, it was complete darkness and the earth itself was as it were in complete chaos it was as it were but a huge drop of water out there in the universe waves and billows and the spirit of God coming down to hover over it to quieten things down and then we read and God said let there be light and well lo and behold there was light just like God said. Alright, there's the light. Now, walk outside if you will, and there's a light in the sky. It's the sun. And uh, in a couple of hours, sun's gone, light's gone. Except for the stars. Where does light come from? Sun and stars. Where does light come from? Did not come from the sun and the stars. They were made on the fourth day. Here on the first day, there's light. No light bearers. There's nothing there to give light, but there is light. I don't understand that, so don't ask me. <laughs> what, was, what was it? All I know is this. There was light and it drove the darkness away. Yeah. Drove the darkness away. That is a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. Yes. He is the light of the world. He made the light of the earth. And there and then later we find he came as the light of the world. 
and he disperses the darkness. You can walk in, you can walk into the darkest room there is and just flick the light switch and let the light come on and the darkness will run. It's gone. It's gone, completely gone. That's what Christ does. He chases the darkness away, the light of the world. He chased mine away. All my darkness, well, when God said, let there be light, He was pointing us to Jesus Christ, who is the light. Mm -hmm. Look further, if you will, um, at, at the end of chapter 1. And uh, God made everything. He had made, and it was good. So the evening and the, or the morning, pardon me, evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then God created it. And then in chapter 2 we read, He rested. He rested. In six days He created everything that was created. Everything. And then He rested. Why? Because He was tired? No, He was not tired. He's, he's God. He's God. Why did He rest? He rested because He was satisfied. He was happy. It would be, it would be like, uh, it would be like an artist who has, who has taken a canvas and, and painted a scene on it and looked up on it and said, it's my masterpiece. Best I've ever done. And what do you do? You sit back and you look at it. Just look at it. Now, I'm not touching that again. <laughs> nope, it's finished. And sit back and, and look at it and in happiness and complacency. And that's what God did. All right. That's the work of creation. Jesus Christ came to this earth and for 33 and a half years walked upon this earth fulfilling God's law. He says, your law is in my heart and I delight to do it. For 33 and a half years, he fulfilled God's law. And then he went to a garden to pray and he said, Father, I have finished the work you have given me to do. It's done. It's done. Now that was the first time he said it's finished. He had to say it again because he had to satisfy God's law not only for himself, giving a perfect obedience he had to satisfy God's law regarding me. God's law says Moose Parks must die. He has to die. He's broken my law and offended me. Moose Parks must die. He must suffer hell. Everlasting hell and damnation. He will endure it. He must. My law requires it. So what is Jesus Christ doing on Calvary? He is suffering my everlasting damnation. He's suffering God's wrath in my behalf and in my, in my stead. And in behalf and in the stead of all God's elect. And for three hours there in total darkness, He cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God says, You've got most parts of sins on you. And I'm going to smite you. And He did. In those three hours, Jesus Christ suffered the everlasting damnation that all God's elect deserve. Yes. And then he said, it is finished. The second time, it is finished. You know what he did then? He took a Sabbath. And he never went back to work. <laughs> God said, come up here, son, sit down. And he did. He sat down. That's why I don't work for my salvation. Yes. The work's already been done. That's right. As God entered into a Sabbath when He made the heavens and the earth, so did Christ enter it, or if you will, so did God enter into a Sabbath when He said it's finished. And I enter into that Sabbath by faith in Him. So that Sabbath in Genesis chapter 2, that's pointing to Christ and the Sabbath that is found in Him. Consider also that tree of life that is in the garden. There's a tree there, tree of life. Adam sinned. He and Eve, they knew they were naked. And so God said, drive them out of the garden and do it before they
they can eat the tree of life. Lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. I'm so glad God did that. I'm so glad. Let me tell you. I'm 70 years old. I'm getting painful. My eyesight's going bad. My hearing's going bad. And I get tired easily. And I'm told it's going to get worse. One of these days, I'm going to look forward to dying. It's beginning to look pretty good already. <laughs> I would hate to live like this forever. Yes. I would hate it. So God said, drive them out before they eat of the tree of life. God took that tree of life and took it to the paradise in heaven. That tree of life, you know what it is? It's Christ. Yes. Christ is the tree of life. It's typical of Him. The leaves of it are for the healing of the nations. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, by the way, is called a tree planted by the rivers of water. Gives forth its fruit in its season. He's the tree of life in the paradise of God. There by the river of water of life. That's Christ. You see that? Yes. You see that tree of life? That's Christ in time and in picture. You see Adam in the garden and he is there with all God's creation and he sees the bear and the elk and the deer and, and all the animals made two by two, a male and its female and Adam looks around and says, he sees, you know, how happy they are. How happy they are before sin entered into the world. How happy they are. And God, God noticed that uh, Adam was a little lonely and uh, so God said, huh, I'm going to do that for Adam. I'm going to make a help me for him. So God performed the first anesthesia, put Adam to sleep. God performed the first surgery, opened his side. Notice, opened his side. God removed a rib from Adam's side, and from that rib, God made woman, brought her to the man, and she became his delight. Well, folks, that's pointing to Christ. Yes. On Calvary, Christ was put to sleep in, in his death. And his side was opened. And from that side came the blood and the water that made pure a wife for Jesus Christ. We came from his side. And therefore, the creation of that first woman, that's pointing to Christ and his wife. Paul makes a point of distressing that in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, I'm talking to you about, about a man and his wife, or really I'm talking to you about, in mystery, Christ and his wife. Consider also that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, and uh, chapter 3, they sinned, and they realized they were naked and they tried to make garments for themselves and then they heard the voice of God walking in the garden. God has come down to walk with fallen creatures. And they hide. Adam, where are you? God knows. He wants Adam to know that Adam is lost and is estranged from God. Where are you? And Adam is found, of course. But here is God coming down to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. You know what? That points to Jesus Christ who left His Father's glory, laid aside His, laid aside his heavenly glory and came to this earth to walk with wretched sinners like you and me. Came down to earth with, to walk with us. And then... Jesus not only came to walk among men, but He came to make their salvation possible. To make their salvation effectual. And to make a sacrifice for their sins. So I'll give you one more time. One more time. Adam and Eve are naked. And 
then we read later on in chapter 3. Go back to chapter 3 for a moment. Genesis chapter 3. Look in verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, Eve, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God clothed them. Now there's the gospel. <laughs> that is the gospel. Yes. God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, preacher, how in the world did you find the gospel in that statement? Well, let, let me ask you this. Where does skin come from? It comes from an animal. How do you get skin from an animal? Now you kill it. Shed its blood. Remove its skin. What did that animal do to die? Nothing. Nothing. The animal is innocent. But God performed the first sacrifice. Yes. Jesus Christ did it as the priest. Yes. Took an innocent animal, brought it over to, to an altar, sacrificed it, shed its blood, then took the skin of that animal and clothed Adam and Eve. And my friend, that is the gospel. Yes. That is the gospel. Yes. Jesus Christ on Calvary. He's the priest. Our high priest made a sacrifice on Calvary. He's the lamb. He's also the sacrifice. He's our priest. He is our sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His blood was shed. Just like in Genesis chapter 3. His blood was shed. That blood made salvation for us as it did also for Adam and Eve in type and in picture. And then Christ takes His own righteousness mm -hmm. and clothes us in it. Clothes us in it. Adam and Eve we're clothed in the, in, in, in the skin of an innocent animal. I am clothed in the righteousness of the Lamb of God. Now folks, I just started. Can you imagine? They walked for seven miles. Mm -hmm. For seven miles. You go to the prophecy of Isaiah. I have preached for weeks in a series from that one chapter. For it, it, it's just so much there. Yes. I can spend the rest of my life just looking for types and shadows. Mm -hmm. Preaching Christ in the Old Testament and never finish it. Like I said before, I would have loved to have heard that message. <laughs> I would have loved to have heard that message. Now tell me something. When you read this book, I'm assuming you do. When you read this book, what do you find in it? It's not just stories. It, there are some great stories, but that's not what it is. These are his stories. This is his story. This is our hymn book. And he is the hymn. And he's all the way through it. I've been preaching Christ from this book and I suppose it's been just about a different message most times I've preached. Sometimes taken a text and maybe done four or five messages and it was different. Different aspects of Christ. Mm -hmm. I cannot exhaust Him. I cannot exhaust Him. But I ask you this. Do you believe Him? Do you see Him in all the Scripture? He's there. Do you believe Him? Oh Lord, open our eyes and our hearts that we might understand these things concerning our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we look for Him and find Him on every page. 
to your glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.